So earlier in the series, when I when I looked at John six uh, earlier in the series, I briefly addressed the issue of of whether Judas was saved or lost his salvation, or was never saved. Now, I asserted, obviously, that he was never saved, but I was fairly brief about that issue. So, uh, in light of what we've been reading in John 13, I'm going to re-explore this issue again, and I'm going to do it in much greater detail here, because although it does, it will have to digress from John 13 for quite a while, the, the passage here does give us some insight as to why Jesus recruited Judas as a disciple if if we are to say that he was never saved okay so if i you know if i assert that Judas was was never saved some questions need to be answered such as why would Jesus include an unsaved person as one of his disciples okay and there's various other questions that people ask and what we need to be able to do as well is refute some of the counter arguments that conditional security advocates will use so the, there are three possible positions on this issue. So position one is that Judas was not, uh, was sorry, was saved and did not lose his salvation, but he did suffer loss. Now I don't know anybody who asserts this position. It's a very unusual position to hold, and really, when when we look at the other two, I think that will really be easily debunked by default, really, as as we explore this issue. Uh, so the, the second possibility is that Judas was saved and then he lost his salvation. So this is the prominent position held by. Uh, conditional security advocates, such as, for example, Jesse Morell, who I'm, I'm going to be um, debunking in, in this, this part of the video. Uh, he's done several videos where he asserts that Judas lost his salvation. So we'll explore some of the talking points on this and, and refute them. And then the third position, which is the position that I hold, is that Judas was never saved, so he didn't lose his salvation because he didn't have it. Uh, this is the position that I hold, as does anybody who believes in free grace, uh, eternal security, or, but also Calvinists with the perseverance of the saints would, would believe this as well. Okay. So just skimming over these uh, verses here in John 13, what, what does this all tell us about Judas's membership as a disciple? Well, um, first of all, in verse 18, it says, but the scripture may be fulfilled. So we see that it was necessary in the Old Testament uh, for certain scriptures relating to Jesus must be fulfilled in the New Testament. So if, if they're not fulfilled, Jesus couldn't refute prophecies pointing to him, and so he couldn't be the Christ by definition. Okay, so that gives us one indication it's to fulfill scripture. Uh, verse 21 says, one of you shall betray me. So as uh, demonstrated in John 6 earlier in the series, Jesus already foreknew that Judas would betray him. Okay. Jesus already knows this about Judas before it happens. That's another important point. Okay. Now we then see between verses 22 to 25 that the disciples doubting of whom he spoke, they're asking who it is. So the disciples couldn't discern among one another who would betray Jesus. They had absolutely no idea it was false. Who was false? It, it could have been any one of the 12 as far as they were concerned. Maybe Peter thought, oh, maybe it's John or maybe it's Andrew. It, it, it could have been any of them as far as they knew. Okay. Now, as we get to 26 to 29, Jesus gives them an indication by dipping the sop. Uh, he gave it to Judas Iscariot. And then he said, he sent Judas Iscariot away. And yet, despite doing this, even as Jesus provides clear hints here that Judas is the one that would betray him, the disciples still don't discern this, okay? They still have, uh, they still don't put the two and two together, even though it seems like Jesus is making it quite obvious in verse 26 without saying it in front of Judas, okay? So, what are the arguments then, uh, supporting that Judas lost his salvation? The idea that he was saved and then he lost his salvation. Now, uh, conditional security advocates may use a variety of logical steps to assert this, to, to reach this assertion. So, for example, our argument one, well, Judas was a disciple, so there are certain logical steps used to assert that he once had salvation, which is supposedly proven by the authority that Jesus had given him. Uh, the second argument is that there are some verses that people would quote directly as proof texts, if you like, about Judas being lost or fallen. And, and these are supposedly the proof texts that he lost his salvation. And so we're going to explore both of these arguments and we're going to see their shortcomings. Okay. So dealing with the first argument that, that Judas, as Judas was a disciple, 
there are certain logical steps that we therefore conclude that he was saved. So um, Jesse Morell has discussed the issue of Judas several times on his channel. Uh, he claims that because Judas was used by Jesus to preach the gospel and, and cast out devils, that he must have been saved. And, and one of the arguments he uses is that, well, the devil cannot cast out his own devils. So as you read Mark 3, uh, in the same chapter, he gives them the authority to cast out devils to, to the twelve. But then later in that same chapter, we have uh, the Pharisees and Jews co confronting Jesus um, about, 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 because they accuse him of casting out the devils by the power of Satan. But how can Satan cast out Satan? And so obviously, when you put those two together, and, and they're really in the same chapter there, uh, you, you can see why he would jump to that, that conclusion. Okay. Um, it's also asserted as well that um, Jesus prepared Judas a throne in heaven. So he wouldn't have prepared a throne for Judas if he wasn't saved at the time when Jesus said this. So Judas had a throne in heaven, but lost it. Um, and this comes from Matthew 19, where he said unto his disciples, uh, you shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And so that, that's the verse he will go to. We'll see Judas had a throne. Okay. Uh, the second argument is that some people will quote verses directly about Judas being lost or fallen, and so they're kind of irrefutable proof texts that Judas lost his salvation. So this guy here, he's called Keith, but his, his channel's called Why City Preachers. So in this particular video, You Can't Lose Salvation, he, he, re try, he was refuting eternal security as preached uh, from John 6, which I have used to advocate for eternal security earlier in the series. Uh, which says that Jesus should lose nothing regarding those that he gives eternal life to. So Keith's refutation of that is that Judas was saved at one point, but then was lost according to John 17, uh, where it says, I have kept them in uh, your name. Those that you gave me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, uh, referring to Judas, that, that the scripture might be fulfilled as we saw in, in John 13. So we'll, we'll uh, need to explore that as well. I think as well, uh, Jesse Morell has made the same argument in his video, Yes, You Can Lose Salvation, Epic Bible Study. Um, about 57 minutes and 15 uh, uh, seconds in, he says, uh, Jesus said to the Father, that that, that same verse that, that Keith was quoting. And so what he then says in the dialogue is that, in other words, Jesus lost Judas. That's what that verse is saying. This is uh, Jesse Morell's quote uh, in bold there. That's what he's saying from that verse. Now, another verse that I have also heard used to suggest that Judas lost his salvation is in Acts one twenty five, where it says, Judas, by transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. That's that's another one of the proof texts, so we'll, uh, we'll need to look at that as well. Okay. So, first, let's explore the issue about Judas preaching the gospel and casting out devils. And we'll quickly discover why this logical leap doesn't really prove that Judas was saved. And so just as a reminder, here's the logical steps that they will make. Well, Judas preached the gospel and cast out devils. Uh, and then they'll say, well, Jesus would never ordain a false prophet to preach the gospel and Satan cannot cast out Satan. Therefore, Judas must have been saved initially. But because he, uh, because we know he was false, he must have lost his salvation. Okay. So, First, we must consider, did Judas really preach a false gospel? And if he did, should Jesus have ordained him to preach the gospel? Okay. Well, problem number one is that, well, I need to know what verse or passage are you citing that says that Judas preached a false gospel? Now, I know that Judas was false, but we don't really know what kind of gospel he would have preached. Um, so, you know, we know that Judas was false to Jesus, betraying him. This is abundantly clear in the scripture. We, we don't know what kind of gospel message Judas would have actually preached. Did he preach something other than the kingdom of God is near? Well, there's no evidence of this that I know of. Post one in the comments if I've missed something. Uh, did he preach something other than believe on the Lord Jesus Christ that thou shalt be saved? Well, again, we, we don't really know because we don't really have it documented what the disciples were going around preaching when, when Judas, uh, sorry, when Jesus sent them out. So it is actually possible that Judas uh, preached the correct, I'll, I won't say the correct gospel, but the correct gospel message, even though he himself was false. Now, this is perfectly plausible because of what we read in John 13 during this study, that even after Jesus sent hints to the other disciples to indicate that Judas was false, 
they still didn't realize that he was false and they were going around preaching with him. So they didn't pick up on anything wrong with what he was saying. They didn't realize that Jesus was caught calling him false then and there in John 13. So, uh, you know, did Judas really preach false gospel? And if he did, should Jesus have ordained him to preach the gospel then? Well, really, I think saying that Jesus should not have sent Judas to preach if he was a false prophet is, is really to assume the conclusion, because you have to arbitrarily decide that you think Jude, uh, Jesus should not have sent Judas to preach. OK, we, we have already seen from John 13, and we saw it earlier in John 6, 6 as well, that Jesus chose Judas already knowing that he is false to the intent that scripture would be fulfilled. So even if Judas did preach a false gospel and you ask, well, why did Jesus choose him to preach the gospel then? But the thing is, this all has to happen that scripture might be fulfilled. OK, so we, we saw this in John 13. I, I know who I am, I've chosen, but that the scripture might be fulfilled. Uh, and then in John 6, um, earlier in the series, we read that, well, Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not on who should betray him. And then later in that same chapter, have not I chosen you 12 and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot. So he chose Judas knowing that he is a devil. OK, so these scriptures indicate Jesus picked Judas, already recognising that he was false to the intent that scripture might be fulfilled. And the disciples could not even discern that he was false. OK, so if he's preaching a false gospel, why didn't the disciples discern that? OK, so... um. So, you know, why would Jesus pick a false disciple and yet Judas would be so indiscernible to the disciples? Well, we've already seen that it's a, it's a scripture would, would be uh, fulfilled. But also you can apply a wider allegorical lesson to John 13, that even in Christendom, we won't always recognise false prophets easily, at least not straight away. OK, so expanding on this, uh, we know obviously that Jesus warned us about false prophets in the Sermon on the Mount. They are wolves in uh, inwardly, but on the outside they wear sheep's clothing. Now, we typically take that to mean that they appear meek and gentle rather than dangerous and hostile, which is true. But by wearing sheep's clothing, they can also appear as one of Jesus' flock if we take the sort of sheep um, analogy from John chapter 10 that, that, you know, Jesus has his sheep. So you could also interpret that as they look like Jesus' sheep, not just that they're meek and gentle. Uh, we can only know them by their fruits, not the tree itself. So un unless you have expertise in arboriculture or horticulture, agriculture, the chances are that, like me, you probably don't really know how to recognise a lot of different fruit trees if they aren't growing fruit, OK? It, however, if you see fruit grow on them, then you will know what kind of tree is. So if I see a tree that doesn't have apples on it, I don't know if it's an apple tree. I only know if it's an apple tree if I look at it and it has apples on it. That's the only way I know. OK, now, maybe some of you are experts in these fields and you know, but, you know, the average man doesn't. So with this in mind, then, Judas's betrayal of Jesus wasn't manifest yet. Remember that fruit, if, if we if we can know false prophets by their fruit, fruit doesn't just spring up out of nowhere. It takes time to grow fruit. So you won't recognize it straight away. So the fruit of Judas wasn't manifest yet. And so the disciples couldn't really discern that he was false because they had not yet seen the corrupt fruit of Judas. So they couldn't really yet know that the fruit tree itself was corrupt because it didn't have any fruit yet. OK, so you might ask them, well, even if Judas's corrupt fruit, his betrayal of Jesus, was not yet known, surely when they were out preaching with Judas, they should have recognised him then, uh, unless he was producing good fruit or, you know, preaching the correct gospel, casting out devils. And so that's something that someone will ask to suggest that Judas was saved, because otherwise the disciples um, would pick up on that. Well, you might see this. Uh, this is undermining the responses I, I gave to the first problem. But but what you have to consider the following points. What Judas actually preached and whether he could cast out devils should not automatically mean, uh, should not automatically be asserted to mean that he was producing good fruit. It is possible that his preaching never actually got anybody saved, even if he was preaching the right message superficially um, and his casting of the devils could have been temporary or fake we we don't really know you know it's possible that he just faked casting out devils 
If false prophets were that easy to identify, Jesus wouldn't really need to warn us about them in Matthew 7. He, he had to warn us because they're hard to identify. And, and as I mentioned in the previous slide, fruit takes a while to grow. It doesn't grow instantaneously. And so it's possible that J Judas still preached correctly and cast out devils, but the true fruit of his works or the outcome or the product of what he did was not yet truly manifest. So, for example, maybe he only ever produced false converts. And even after casting out devils, maybe the recipients didn't get eternally saved from those encounters. Whereas many of other uh, Jesus's recipients or the other disciples' recipients did. They just did it with Judas. So Judas could have preached the right message and, and cast out devils. It just didn't really have any lasting effect to the saving of the soul. Okay. Um, and problem number three is that if, if the disciples, remember that the disciples predominantly went as a group or two by two. So the, in Mark, I cited a few slides ago that this didn't happen yet. He, he gave them the power and ordained them to preach. But later in Mark 6, that's when Ju uh, Jesus sends out the 12 in pairs. So even if Judas was false, and let, let's just say for the sake of argument, he could not wield the power of the other disciples. He was still paired with a disciple that was not false. So as long as Judas didn't preach anything too false or too off base, that the paired disciple wouldn't discern that he is false. Uh, and, the, and the paired disciple may also provide important biblical truth while the pair of them are preaching to the recipient. And um, let me give you um, a couple of examples of passable language to show that Judas could have employed something similar where he's not outright preaching a false gospel, but it's difficult to recognize that he is preaching a false gospel. Okay. So on my channel, I'm not going to get into it in this video, but I've argued extensively on my channel that the re repent of your sins to be saved mantra is the broad road leading to destruction that deceives millions of Christians and that faith alone is the narrow road leading to life. On the contrary, a repent of your sins preacher, so Jesse Morell is one of them, Y City Preachers is one of them, they would say that you have to repent of your sins to be saved. They they would, on the other hand, say that my faith alone gospel is, well, I don't say my, I mean, you know, everybody that believes that. They say that that's the broad road that deceives millions of Christians and that their repent of your sins gospel is, is the narrow road. So I claim that I'm on the narrow road and they're on the broad road. They claim that I'm on the broad road and they're on the narrow road. Now, part of this confusion is because of the language that a lot of evangelical Christians use, which... On the surface, sounds like faith alone language, which is difficult to discern at first. But if you were to really think about it carefully and break it down, is it really faith alone language or rather is it works language that ma masquerades as faith alone? A lot of Christians use what I would call spectrum language. We, we have faith alone and we have faith and works, but they use language that sort of bridging those two on this spectrum where it's not really clear exactly where someone's trying to place themselves. So here I'm going to give you some examples of, of this spectrum language. So example number one, case in point, repent of your sins to be saved. Well, this phraseology will mean different things to different people. It's spectrum language. So if, if, if someone who does believe in faith alone, and, and they do really believe that, but they were to say that, you ask them, well, what exactly do you mean by repent of your sins to be saved? They will say, well, you recognize that you are a sinner in need of a savior and you trust in Jesus to save you. Well, that, that's what, that's what I believe. But that, that's what they're in, that's what they think that that's what that means, repent of your sins. Now, if you ask Keith or Jesse or someone on the work, faith plus work side, they will say, they will define that as repent of your sins to be saved. You must not sin anymore. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. That's how they define repent of your sins. So you see, it's the same phrase, but two people are interpreting it completely differently. Now, people that are sort of on the spectrum, like Calvinists and Reformed, they'll say, well, it, it doesn't mean perfection, but there must be some evidence of, of change. That's the kind of thing that like Billy Graham would say, for example. So that's kind of that then they're are they over there or are they over there it's not exactly clear but you see it's the same phrase being used by all three different ends of the spectrum okay so even though this is not biblical phraseology like the bible doesn't say repent of your sins to be saved and i know there's phrases that people will take that, that sound similar but it, it never says that verbatim phrase you can see how both a true prophet and a false prophet could use this same terminology 
according to either paradigm. So if the disciples were all preaching faith alone, but then Judas, let's say Judas was preaching, repent of your sins to be saved. Well, the disciples could have interpreted it as that that's what they thought, that that's what Judas meant, when maybe Judas actually meant something over here. So it's not obvi- it wouldn't be obvious that the other person preaches a different gospel. Okay. Now, here's another example. When people say, surrender your life to Christ to be saved, or surrender to his lordship to be saved, again, this phrase, this phraseology will mean different things to different people. It's spectrum language. So if we ask the faith alone guy, what what do you mean surrender everything to Jesus? What does that mean? Well, say, well, you cannot save yourself. So no, you call upon the Lord Jesus and he will save you freely. You just have to give everything to him. Let him be your saviour. That That's how he would interpret that statement. Whereas if we ask faith and works guy over here, surrender everything to Jesus, you know, you must give up your sin and everything else. And if you're clinging on to anything, you won't be saved. That same, same phrase, but a completely different meaning because it's not clear what that phrase actually means. It's spectrum language. And then obviously the, these guys that are kind of in the middle there that, the you know, most evangelicals, they'll say, well, you submit to his lordship so that, you know, he can begin to make changes in your life. Well, if he begins to make changes, it sounds almost like they're over here because I don't, I don't need to make those changes to be saved. God will begin it. But then if God has to make these changes, then we're still kind of over here then because we must see this. So again, you can see how this phrase can fit anywhere on this spectrum. So if the disciples are preaching one of these things and Judas is preaching a different thing, we don't really know because this phrase doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us where on this spectrum you actually sit. Okay, so again... This is not biblical phraseology. The Bible never says surrender your life to Christ to be saved. It's just, it's parroted spectrum language that evangelical Christians use, and it will mean different things to different people. So a false prophet and a true prophet could use this same phrase. They're not easily going to be able to identify each other as preaching an opposing gospel. You see, Mr. Faith alone says surrender to Jesus to be saved. Faith plus works guy says surrender everything to Jesus to be saved. Well, they're not, if they just hear that from each other, they're going to think, yeah, amen, we preach the same gospel. But when you really get down to the nitty gritty, they don't. Okay. Um, and then another example um, is this, have a personal relationship with Jesus to be saved. It's all about relationship, people say. Well, again, this phrase will mean different things to different people. One guy says, well, don't shut Jesus out, you know, turn to Jesus, call upon him alone, ask him, you know, uh, and ask him in prayer and he will save you. He will take that statement, have a personal relationship as faith alone language. The works guy, well, he's going to say, you know, you must be on your knees every day seeking him in prayer. Otherwise, you are not saved because you lack this relationship. And then, you know, people in the middle, are, you know, whenever you feel like giving up, you just keep clinging and turning on to Jesus and stay focused on him. It's this idea that we have to keep focusing because we're constantly, you know, at risk of losing that, that focus. And that's that relationship there, that working relationship. So, again, you know, we, we see that this same type of language, the Bible never says this phrase. The Bible never says have a relationship with Jesus. It's just something that Christians from across this spectrum all say. So we don't know if they're preaching a false gospel or not, because we don't know what they mean by these catchphrases. So bringing this back to Judas then, if Judas had used this same kind of language, this sort of spectrum language, when he was preaching the gospel, it wouldn't be immediately obvious to the paired disciple that Judas was false. So even if Judas was always false, he could have just as well used similar kinds of language that ensured that he never truly preached the correct biblical gospel, but he wasn't entirely obviously preaching a false gospel either. Okay, so in conclusion to the first point then, just because Judas was ordained to preach, that, that has no correlation with his salvation. It's perfectly plausible that Jesus sent him out to preach, despite the fact that Judas was false. So, you know, the idea that Judas was sent to preach is not really a valid argument to assert that Judas was saved or that he was once a true prophet at some point in history. And and so the next point then is, what about the casting of devils then? Because didn't Jesus make it clear that Satan cannot cast out, or at least he would not cast out his own devils? Well, the problem number one with this is that we already saw in previous lists of problems that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. So Judas was presumably paired with a good disciple when casting out devils. Now this is assume, this is if we assume that Judas didn't have the power to do it himself if he was not saved. 
So it's perfectly plausible that Judas and the, the good disciple would perform the exorcism at the same time for the same devil to come out, doing it as a pair. But it was the power of the good disciple that did the actual casting. And so the good disciple was completely unaware that Judas was not supplying any spiritual power to the exorcism because, well, they both cast out that devil and the devil comes out the the disciple the other disciple doesn't necessarily know that it's his power alone okay that's if you know if we assume that that kind of a paradigm and so uh, the the second problem then is that we often assume that Judas could only have this power if he was saved but it's not entirely implausible that Judas was given the power by Jesus to cast out devils even if he was false anyway, okay? Because remember, J Jesus needs a false disciple, um, as we, we saw earlier, so that scripture can be fulfilled. So if he didn't give Judas that power, well, then the disciples might cotton on too early that Judas was false, and that would prevent scripture being fulfilled. So, you know, there may have been some eternal necessity that Jesus had to give him this power, even if he wasn't saved. Now, there are some verses that suggest this power is exclusively for believers, such as Mark 16, 17, these signs shall follow them that believe, they shall cast out devils. Um, Acts 19, uh, also there were some Jewish exorcists and, and they couldn't cast out the um, evil spirits. But remember that both of these verses refer to after the cross, not before. And Jesus did not directly give any authority to the Jewish exorcists in um, Acts chapter 19. And really, yeah, that like Mark 16 makes it look like it's for them who believe. But don't just read that verse in amnesia to everything else that the Bible says, because... Yeah, if we look at Matthew 7 and the Sermon on the Mount, there there are going to be many people who say, Lord, have we not cast out devils? So they're bragging about casting out devils, but they're filed under, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. So that, now this passage doesn't necessarily say whether they're casting out devils was a legitimate power, you know, maybe they were fakers, but either way, it doesn't really matter because we can interpret Judas to be the same, okay, whether Judas did it or whether he, he, he faked it. So conditional security doesn't really work here because Jesus said, I never knew you. Not, I used to know you, but you lost your salvation and I don't know you anymore. It's, I never knew you. Okay. Now, I'm only saying that it's plausible that Judas could cast out devils by the power of God despite being unsaved. I'm not saying that that's how I believe it happened, but it doesn't prove, it, it certainly doesn't prove that he, he was saved. Okay. It, it's not really a guarantee that he was saved. And also, as well, uh, you know, does just building on that same idea, Revelation 16, um, we have the uh, unclean things, the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the, the spirits of devils working miracles. Okay, so whether Judas could or c could not cast out devils, he could certainly, you know, spirits of devils can work miracles and they can at least make it look like miracles are happening. So, uh, you know, that, that, that may or may not include the casting out devils. Now, what about then Satan casting cannot cast out Satan? Well, you, you could consider the possibility really that Satan doesn't cast his dis demons out, rather the demons leave at his command. So Satan could still give the illusion that demons are being cast out when they're actually in, in a way being requested out. In other words, because remember when Jesus is casting out devils, the devils won't leave when anybody else tells them to. Okay, the devils don't want to leave. Jesus has to command them to leave, otherwise they won't leave. Uh, and Jesus is doing that contrary to the will of those devils. Whereas if Satan is their leader, so to speak, they're going to obey him anyway. So Satan doesn't have to cast them out. Satan simply has to command or request them out. But it, it's not really the same thing. And I understand that that is purely conjectural on my part. And again, I'm, I'm saying it's plausible. I'm not saying that that's how it happened. So one could debate whether these miracles were actually genuine or a fake illusion. But either way, we can apply that to Judas. It's entirely possible that Judas could fake having the power of God. Okay. So in conclusion, then neither of these two things really prove that Judas was eternally saved. That That's not really a strong enough case. Okay. So what about the next issue then? What about the um, throne in heaven? Because that was one of Jesse Morell's other logical steps that um, the issue of Jude Jesus losing Judas regarding his salvation as well. So Jesus offered 12 thrones in heaven for the 12 disciples, including Judas, but then Judas fell by transgression. So he had a throne, but he lost his throne. And therefore, Judas lost his salvation by forfeiting the throne reserved for him in heaven. Because what they'll say is, well, why would Jesus give him a throne if he's not saved anyway? Well, 
let's take a look again at Matthew 19, 28, but we'll also see John 17 as well as we look at this issue. So in Matthew 19, so in verse 25, it's his disciples. So we assume that Jesus is talking to his 12 disciples. And after chapter 19, when we get into chapter 20, he's going to tell a parable and then he will confirm that Jesus will take the 12 to Jerusalem. Now, remember this because this is going to be important momentarily, but context would seem to assume that it's only the 12 disciples that Jesus is talking to here. So it doesn't include any other disciples. Okay. Now, in verse 27, Peter is, speaks uh, on behalf of all the 12 disciples, saying, Behold, we have forsaken all, we have followed thee, what, what shall we have there for? So he's speaking for all the 12. But it's important to note that this does not automatically mean that Peter represents them all just because he speaks on their behalf. And we'll see in a few slides why that is. I, I will, you know, I will expand on that. And then in verse 28, Jesus then confirms that the 12 thrones, it's not 11 thrones, it's 12 thrones. But his choice of wording is very important. Now, so this is the verse that Jesse Morrell has used to assert that Judas was once saved and then lost his salvation. But really, this verse arguably refutes it. And I'll explain why that is. And so hold on to these points while we cross-reference it with other scriptures as well. So let's have a look at John 17 and cross-references. So in John 17, this is Jesus' final prayer in John before Judas betrays him. And Judas has already left the um, other disciples. So is it, Jesus is praying for his disciples specifically. He's not praying for all believers, okay, because he's going to do that later in verse 20. So at the moment, he's only praying for his disciples. So this is the verse 11 and 12 where uh, Jesus keeps the ones that the Father has given him. And none of them is lost but the son of perdition, referring to Judas. And the purpose was that scripture would be fulfilled. And then um, down in verse 15, um, when we look at Jesus' praise for his disciples, I pray that you, sh uh, not that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil. Well, that prayer for the disciples, arguably, that prayer wasn't really answered in Judas because Judas wasn't really kept from evil. So his prayer there didn't even apply to Judas because, or, or if it did, God, did, you know, the father didn't answer that prayer. Okay. So um, did Judas really have a throne prepared and then lost it? Well, you know, did G Jesus really lose Judas? Well, John 6 helps us to understand the full picture of what's going on in regard to Judas. So in John chapter 6, earlier in the chapter, not, not speaking about Judas specifically, but speaking about eternal life, Jesus said, All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. So uh, the Father must give them to Jesus for, for eternal life to happen. Okay, this must happen. And once this happens in verse 39, this is the Father's will, that all which he has given me, so once the Father has given them unto Jesus for eternal life, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day and then he that believes on him uh, you know believes on him has an eternal life and i will raise him up at the last day so we we clearly see jesus talking about eternal life he's not talking about discipleship he's not talking about the obedient life of the believer he's talking to a group of unsaved jews we saw that when we studied john chapter 6 going back to the basics to tell them what they have to do for eternal life okay so uh, it's important that we understand that in context when jesus said i should lose nothing we're talking about eternal life and so this is really what needs to be answered when we look at judas being lost because um why city preachers he was doing a video refuting this that no actually Jesus can lose some because he, he lost Judas. Uh, so he was refuting John 6 with John 17. Okay. So, so we have some fundamental problems here that need to be resolved. In John 6, Jesus says, I should lose nothing regarding eternal life. Yet in John 17, Jesus did keep the disciples, but Judas was lost. Well, this is easy to reconcile because John 6, and to a lesser extent, John 17 already answers this conundrum okay that the 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 passages that they're trying to wrestle against each other they already solve this problem for you so later in john chapter 6 after jesus has declared that he should lose nothing regarding those that he gives eternal life to later in that chapter some people 
did depart from him. Some of his disciples, not the twelve, left him. And Jesus reveals something very important about Judas. So between verses 64 to 66, uh, many disciples leave Jesus and it's confirmed Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Jesus knew that from the beginning. Okay. And notice that he, cat he doesn't categorize them as those who believed but don't believe anymore. It's who they were that believe not. You believe not. You, you don't believe. Okay. That's how he's categorizing them there. Okay. And so those disciples walk no more with him. And, and Jesus knows this from the beginning. And also who should betray him. Jesus knows from the beginning. Okay. Now then, in uh, verses 67 to 70, Jesus turns to the twelve Will you also go away? Will you leave like these disciples are leaving? Now, again, just as we saw in Matthew 19, Peter takes it upon himself to answer for the other 12 disciples. They don't all say this. Peter is saying this on their behalf. Lord, to who shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we, the 12, Peter speaking on behalf of the 12, are sure that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, Despite the fact that Peter has spoken on behalf of all disciples, Jesus confirms that one of the twelve is a devil. Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Not you will be a devil, you is a devil, okay? You are a devil. And then the author, John, confirms that he sp spoke of Judas Iscariot, okay? So, you know, when he says, you are, you are a devil... He doesn't mean like Peter when he said, you know, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. He doesn't mean that. He's talking about Judas Iscariot because he knows from the beginning who should betray him. OK, so the author confirms who we're talking about here. So there's a few things going on here. When we bring John 6 together with John 13, John 17 and Matthew 19, we see how the Bible all sings together like, a, you know, all singing on the same song sheet. Just because Peter spoke on behalf of all the disciples, we believe and are sure, that does not mean that he represents all the 12 disciples because of the fact that Jesus pointed out in response to Peter that one of you is a devil. So just because Peter said, we are sure that you are the Christ, all of us, that doesn't mean that it applied to Judas. That doesn't mean that Peter can speak on behalf of Judas. So with that in mind, then, there is no reason to believe that Peter can collectively represent the other disciples in Matthew 19 either. So just because Peter says, we have forsaken all and followed you, that does not mean that it applies to Judas. That does not mean that Judas has forsaken all to follow you. Okay, Peter can't speak on behalf of Judas here. Now then, Peter has already stated, we have forsaken all, we have followed you on behalf of other disciples. But then notice what Jesus says. Jesus doesn't just say you in the regeneration. He said you which have followed me. Well, Peter already said we have followed thee. So why does Jesus need to add those words? Because he could have just said in response, you in the regeneration of the son. But he doesn't. He say, Peter says we have followed you. Jesus replies, you which have followed me. OK, so then the, Jesus's words here would be completely redundant unless there is somebody among them who has not followed Jesus, okay? Now, bearing in mind that he is only speaking to his 12 disciples, he's not speaking to the other disciples that departed in John 6. It's the 12 that he's talking to in this context, okay? So then, just because Jesus says that they will sit on 12 thrones, that doesn't mean that Judas is automatically included, because even if Judas is excluded from the throne... That doesn't change the fact that the remainder of the disciples who have followed Jesus will still sit upon 12 thrones, but the 12th throne will be filled by somebody else. OK, finally, if we look at what happens shortly after Matthew 19, you will see why it doesn't really make much sense to include Judas in receiving the 12 thrones, aside from the fact point that we've already mentioned. So in Matthew 20, on the same conversation, in the same context, Jesus gives a parable of the labourers in the vineyard, 
And then he says to them in verse 17, we're going to Jerusalem uh, and we're taking, uh, Jesus goes to Jerusalem and takes the 12 with him. We go to Jerusalem that the son of man shall be betrayed. So why are they going to Jerusalem? So that Jesus can be betray betrayed onto the chief priests and onto the scribes and they shall condemn him to death. So immediately after the conversation, when Jesus has given those 12 thrones, speaking to the 12 disciples, he, they're immediately going to Jerusalem so that Judas can betray Jesus. So this conversation must have happened fairly recently prior to the conversation in John 13. So even when Jesus issued the thrones, this is leading up to the fact that he knows that he will be betrayed and he's going to Jerusalem so that Judas can betray him. Okay. Now, uh, just a quick objection that somebody might throw. Why would Jesus bother to say 12 thrones in Matthew 19 if only 11 of the disciples would receive a place? Why, you know, why not say 11 thrones? Well, should he have not indicated to his disciples that one of them would not receive a throne if, if what I say is true? Okay. So, well, remember that there are 12 tribes to be judged and there's a throne for each tribe. So, so somebody somewhere will have to sit in the 12th throne anyway. If it's not Judas, somebody's going to have to sit there. There are 12 thrones. Jesus already commented that one of the disciples was false previously in John 6, but didn't reveal who it was. Now, John himself, when he wrote the gospel account, revealed who it was, but Jesus didn't reveal it there and then. He just said, one of you is a devil. And it, it's not evident from John 6 that the disciples further questioned him about this. Okay. Now, in Matthew 19, Jesus and the 12 were already headed to Jerusalem anyway so that Jesus could be betrayed. And it was during his final moments with the disciples that G Jesus would be much clearer about their being a false disciple. This was not revealed earlier in Matthew 19. So if Jesus would have revealed it in Matthew 19 and said 11 thrones and there's 12 of them, they'd be like, hang on a minute, what's going on here? Jesus would have aroused suspicion or questioning too early, okay, before, you know, John 13. And even in John 13, when Jesus hinted who was the false disciple, the other disciples still didn't grasp that it was Judas anyway. Okay. So then when we, when we piece this all together, you, you quickly realize how absurd it is really to assert that, uh, to assert that Judas was included in the giving of the 12 thrones on the premise that he was saved eternally at the time. Because in John 13 and John 17, this is Jesus speaking to his disciples and, and praying very shortly before his betrayal. So this is one of the last things that Jesus did before Judas betrays Jesus. He signals to the other disciples that Judas will betray him before he sends Judas away to carry out this purpose. And, and in his prayer in John 17, before Judas even betrays him, Jesus already points out that he's lost. Jesus knows that Judas is false before Judas does the false thing. Okay. Now, in Matthew 19 and 20, Jesus is taking the 12 disciples to Jerusalem so that Jesus can be portrayed. OK, while at the same time, he's giving the 12 thrones in this same conversation while he's already going to be portrayed by Judas. So this must have also happened not too long before John 13 and John 17, because they're going to Jerusalem to do this. OK, now then, in John chapter 6... This must have happened much early because Jesus had more than 12 disciples in that chapter and many of them left him with only the 12 remaining. And even back then, so even before all of this, Jesus already points out, one of you is a devil, knowing from the beginning who betrayed would betray him. So if Jesus already knows all the way back here at this point in time that Judas was false, okay, and it, Jesus then issues the 12 thrones. He's already taking them to Jerusalem so that Judas can betray him. It, it's utterly ridiculous to say that Judas was initially saved and given a throne when Jesus knows what Judas is about to do and already know, knew that long before this. Okay, it's like, I already know you're false here and I'm taking you to Jerusalem here so that you can be false to me, but I'm still going to give you a throne anyway for the five minutes between here and here that you're actually saved. I mean, think about how ridiculous and absurd that is. Okay. And the next point is, you'll say, people will say then, well, well, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus say here, I should lose nothing? Okay. But then... In John 17, none of them is lost but the son of perdition. So did Jesus lose Judas or not? 
what's that all about? So that that's well, we'll just look at that next, okay? Well, in uh, John, J John seventeen, where this sorry where this comes from, uh, we need to focus on verse twelve here. This is the crux of the matter, okay? Uh, but but this this statement is also important as well, though, in a way, uh, verse fifteen that um, Jesus prays that they should be kept from the evil. Now, first of all, I want you to notice what Jesus did not say. Okay, Jesus did not say, "I have lost Judas." That that's not what he said. Okay, what Jesus actually said was, "None of them is lost, but Judas." Like, it didn't say Jesus lost Judas; it just said none of them is lost, but Judas. Okay, so there are actually two ways of reading this statement, depending on how you look at it. So if you read it this way, then yeah, it looks like Judas, uh, Jesus lost Judas. Those that you gave me, I've kept, but then none of them is lost, but the son of perdition. You know, kind of, kind of lost the son of perdition there. But if you actually read it like this, it, it looks like Judas was already lost, which is consistent with what we've seen in other passages. Those that you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost. So I, I've kept those that you gave me. I've not lost any of them, okay? But the son of perdition is lost. Now, why is the son of perdition lost? Because I lost him? No, that's not what it says. It's so that scripture might be fulfilled. Judas was already lost, so that scripture might be fulfilled, okay? Secondly, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is praying specifically for his disciples. He won't pray for all believers until verse 20. So with this in mind, then we cannot even say from John 17 itself that Judas lost his from his eternal life, only that he was really lost as a disciple. Now, when Jesus said, I should lose nothing, he wasn't talking about his disciples. He was talking about eternal life and anybody that received it. OK, now later in that same chapter, just as Judas betrayed him, well, many of his other, many other disciples walk no more with him. But concerning their eternal life, it says Jesus knew from the beginning that, who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So Jesus knows it from the beginning. So it's quite meaningless then to say that they were temporarily saved if Jesus already knows they won't be in the end anyway. OK, and thirdly, you, you need to ask yourself this question. What what does Jesus' statement in John seventeen twelve even mean? What is the purpose of Jesus saying those that you gave me, I have kept. If Jesus has kept them, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, well, is he supposed to have kept his disciples from losing his eternal life? Is that even what, what that means? Is he supposed to have kept his disciples from losing their office or discipleship? Or is he supposed to have kept his disciples from something else entirely? What is he supposed to have kept them from? Okay. Well, the answer is super simple because John is going to tell us in the next chapter. All we have to do is go forward one chapter. John's gospel is going to tell us. So in John 18, in the first seven verses, Judas betrays Jesus and his other, Jesus and his other disciples are surrounded. OK, Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. So Jesus is uh, revealing his identity among the others. Therefore, you seek me. And, and he says, let these go their way. So Jesus petitions them to let his other 11 disciples go free. Why? 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 Well, it's verse nine that the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake of them, which you gave me. I have lost none. That's the reason. That's the very saying that he said in John 17. Now, it's not an exact quote. He's, he's paraphrasing. But, you know, you go to John 17, those that you gave me, I have kept. None of them is lost. Well, of them which you gave me, I have lost none. So by asking his disciples to go free and not being captured as Jesus was being captured, he's fulfilling his saying that I have kept those that you gave me. OK, so the context then is that Jesus kept his disciples from being put to death like himself. It has absolutely nothing to do with pre preserving their eternal life, because if they would have, you know, been crucified with Jesus, well, presumably they would have had eternal life anyway, is keeping them from the earthly death that he's about to face himself. Now, Jesus successfully fulfilled this commitment. None of the uh, 11 disciples were lost in this context. None of them were arrested. They didn't suffer the same fate that Jesus suffered. Now, Judas died by his own means, so Judas wouldn't have even suffered this same fate as the other disciples anyway. You know, Jesus didn't need to make this commitment over Judas because there was no prospect of Judas being arrested and put to death alongside Jesus. That prospect might have exi might have happened for the other 11 disciples, which is why Jesus had to appeal for them to go uh, to go free. 
So Jesus did not need to petition them to save Judas. Judas was not facing the same risk. Jesus fulfilled his commitment to not lose the other 11 to suffering the same punishment as himself. Judas suffered his own fate, but Jesus didn't lose him because Judas didn't need Jesus' protection in the events of John 18 anyway. Yet, Jesus still describes Judas as being lost. Why? Because he was always lost, okay? Judas was never not lost. He was always lost, okay? So, concluding that point then, we, we can't say that Judas, Jesus lost Judas. We can only say that Judas was lost. And even supposing that Jesus did lose Judas, according to John 17, we, we can only say that Ju Jesus lost him as a disciple or lost it to an early death, not, not from eternal salvation, at least in the context of John 17 anyway. So comparing this with John 6, many other disciples were lost, but it was confirmed that they never believed because Jesus already knew that they would walk no more with him. But regarding those that Jesus has given eternal life to, it's those people that Jesus says, I will lose nothing. Jesus is not obligated to fulfill that commitment to non-believing disciples that do not have eternal life. He has no obligation to fulfill that promise. And Jesus kept his disciples from suffering the same fate as himself. He succeeded in fulfilling this, but Judas was not subject to that fate anyway. Okay. So to bring this issue to a close then, what about Judas falling as described in Acts? And this is Acts one twenty five, where it says, Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. And obviously to fall, you assume that he started somewhere to fall from that, that place. Well, this is quite simple. All, all we have to do is read what Judas fell from. This isn't complicated at all. Notice that the passage does not say Judas fell from salvation or eternal life, or Judas fell from brotherhood or sainthood, or Judas fell from election. It doesn't say anything like that. The passage does say he fell from this ministry and apostleship, okay? And they, they cast the lots and, you know, it was given to Matthias. There are, there are lots of saved believers who didn't have this ministry and apostleship. So this verse is not relevant to Judas' salvation whatsoever, all right? So if Acts 1 was saying that Judas fell from eternal life and lost salvation, well, he couldn't be replaced by Matthias in the next verse because being saved unto eternal life is not a competition, okay? It's specific to every individual. It's not an office that can be replaced. So Matthias was chosen to replace the ministry and the apostleship of Judas, we would then presume, although, you know, maybe don't know for sure, but we would presume that he was given the 12th throne in heaven, which doesn't undermine that Jesus intended for the other 11 disciples in Matthew 19, which you which have followed me shall sit upon 12 thrones. That's, that's not undermined in any way whatsoever, because there are 12 thrones. Okay. So let's, let's finish our study of Judas with our findings. Jesus always knew that Judas was false from the very beginning. Jesus foresaw that Judas was false, would betray him long before he confirmed the reward of the Twelve Thrones. And even when he awarded the Twelve Thrones, he was already on his way to Jerusalem so that Judas could betray him. So it's, you know, ridiculous to say that I'm giving you the Twelve Thrones for, you know, the couple of days that you're going to be saved until you're going to betray me two days later. It's just absurd. Judas was chosen as a disciple, even while being false from the beginning. Why would Jesus choose a false disciple to preach and cast out devils? So that scripture could be fulfilled. That's what the Bible tells us. Jesus confirmed that one of his disciples would betray him to fulfill scripture in John 13. Jesus confirmed that Judas was lost to fulfill scripture in his prayer in John 17. And although we didn't cover Matthew 27, 9 in this study, and that's about the 30 pieces of silver, it confirms that Judas's betrayal fulfills Old Testament prophecy, prophesied long before Jesus came to this earth, or you know, long before Judas was born either. Uh, and although Jesus didn't mention fulfilling prophecy in Matthew 20, 18, he, he did, it was fulfilling what he already told the disciples that would happen earlier um, in Matthew 16, where he, he told them that he must go to be betrayed. Okay. Jesus did not lose Judas. And even if he did, it, it was not in the context of eternal life. Now, Judas was lost as a disciple, or he was that he was lost from the promise of, you know, being kept to not being killed, because obviously he did die in a field, whereas the other disciples were preserved. So you could say he was lost in that aspect. If you're going to say that Jesus even lost him, but he doesn't say that Jesus lost him, just that he was lost. But regarding eternal life, he was always lost. Jesus already knew he was a betrayer. Okay. Judas 
did not fall from eternal life, he fell from office of ministry and apostleship because this office was handed over to somebody else. It's eternal life cannot be handed over to somebody else okay and so when you see all this in its full scope it's really concerning when you hear these arguments such as jesus lost judas like what jesse morell and y city preachers are saying because what they basically have to say then is that jesus is a liar or a failure jesus said regarding eternal life if he gives somebody eternal life that the father has given to him i should lose nothing okay you know, is is Jesus going to do what he should? Because they'll they'll try and pick on the fact that it says should instead of will, but then like the next verse gives a definitive anyway. And if Jesus should do something, is he not going to do it? But then the Bible does not say that Jesus lost Judas, only that Judas was lost, and not in the context of eternal life. So what's their response? Jesus lost Judas. So either Jesus lied or he failed when he said, I should lose nothing regarding eternal life. These men have to make Jude, G, sorry, Jesus a liar or a failure, basically, to, to prop up their doctrine instead of just being, instead of just repenting of being a wicked false prophet. And so, you know, the, these guys want to tell you to repent of all of your sins to be saved. Well, well, they lie about what the Bible says about Judas. They've lied about this. And, you know, they're calling Jesus either a liar or a failure for losing Judas when he said that I should lose nothing. And the Bible doesn't even say that he lost Judas. OK, so, you know, these men are not saved by their own standards. OK, they haven't repented of all of their sins. All liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire. 